Hello gamers, I'm Antonio D'Amico, this is Pointy Hat, and welcome to D&D with a Twist. The show where I throw a dart at one of my D&D books to pick a class, a race, a monster, a spell, a weird little guy, anything but dragons, and then I give whatever the dart landed on a new twist that you can use when playing the game. It's like a caterpillar blossoming to a beautiful butterfly, except instead of a butterfly, it's just weird now. So when I think of Mind Flayers, I think of... I I thought I'd have some cosmic horror, turns out I'm a cosmic horror, I cook Cthulhu good. Mind flayers are the monster for people that are weirdly into Lovecraft and those with creative ideas regarding tentacles. Along with beholders and rows, mind flayers are one of the most iconic villains in D&D. They are aberrations, which as you know, is the monster type reserved for the most gruesome, weird, unnatural, freaky, disgusting creatures in the game. Hey, hey, cut it out! We've gone over this. Stop it. So let's get some terminology out of the way here. Mind flayers are also called illithids. The name was first uttered among mists of time primigenial, back when the world was new. A nearly forgotten era, for now none live who remember it. This time was called... The 70s. I can boogie. Basically, as far as I can find, Mind Flayer was indeed the original term, but when D&D transitioned from hack and slash into a thing with actual lore and monster ecology and stuff, the term illithid was introduced to describe the race. Nowadays, most people use Mind Flayer as like, the common term, what Joe and Joanne that live on the farm five miles away from Waterdeep would call an illithid. Illithid is reserved for scholars, nerds, and that weird bald man that haunts me by doing the DreamWorks face on D&D books. Got this madness. What do you want from me? Ah, what do you want? Please! Mind flayers are squid guys. They are humanoid, but with an octopus for a face. A purple squid thing. I'm like really struggling here not to just describe them as Cthulhu looking guys. Their skin is tiefling colored with illustrations of green and pink mind flayers in older editions, although 5e has seemingly gone for just purple. They are apparently covered in slime, which must mean they must have the most developed and most advanced system of dry cleaning in the universe since they insist on wearing loose flowing robes. They have four tentacles around their gross little lamprey mouths that are actually really strong and can be used in combat, and their hands are just like... Creepy pasta monster hands. Honestly, aside from the very obvious Cthulhu inspiration, Mind Flayers sort of suffer from their own version of the Seinfeld is unfunny effect, as their baseline design has been used and reused so many times that it now feels old hat and uninspired. But back when they were created, there were not as many unknowable, alien, spooky, <laughs> octopus people in popular fiction as they are now. F in chat for them, I guess. A Mind Flayer's signature ability and what basically dictated everything from their combat abilities to their culture is their use of psionics. Psionics are not magic. This is a distinction that D&D nerds will get very mad about, so pay attention. Psionics are basically mind magic. As a matter of fact, that's what normal people call it. Conventional magic draws its power from the weave of magic, whereas psionics use a person's own mind as the source of its power. Psionic powers have some advantages over normal magic, such as requiring no components, being extremely quick to cast, and not being susceptible to changes in magic. A wild magic zone would not affect psionics, for example. Psionics usually target the mind of a creature, or allow a creature to expand what their mind is capable of doing. Moving objects with your mind, seeing into the thoughts of another, controlling someone else, basically everything that Jean Grey can do is considered psionics in the world of D&D. Most of the time, psionic powers are described as something that you either have or you don't. All races produce people with psionic talents, but it's pretty rare. Less than 1 in 10,000 humans are born with psionic powers, and so can be said about most other races. Most but not all. All Mind Flayers have psionic powers, and very, very powerful ones. This grants them telepathy, cool attacks with their Mind Blast, and their diet. You see, Mind Flayers eat brains. Once again, guys, this was the 70s, this was cool and novel at the time, don't bully them. They eat brains apparently because it's good for them, and they are in the thralls of the very pervasive diet culture that plagues Mind Flayer society. But also because they get a little boost to their psionic abilities. There's a lot of text about what brains Mind Flayers like and don't like, and it all reads very baby's first animal fanfic, so you can go read that on your own time. What you gotta remember is that Mind Flayers think that brains are tasty, and enjoy the benefits of their very 
powerful psionic abilities when they get to eat one. Because of their natural talent for psionics, arcane magic is seen as an abomination and inferior to psionics in Mind Flayer society, which might be related to them getting their asses beat with magic a while ago and still being salty about it. But as I said, their psionic abilities influence much more than just their diet. Let's get into the big part of this one. Culture. Mind Flayers, similarly to Droz, are one of the very few D&D monsters with a big emphasis on their way of life, their society, their culture. Mind Flayers are very, very much an amalgamation of scary alien tropes. They are meant to work in ways that seem completely incomprehensible and, well, alien to normal people. Mind Flayer settlements or Mind Flayer colonies, because everything that these guys name has to sound as sciency and spooky as possible, is structured around an elder brain. An elder brain is the amalgamation of dead Mind Flayer brains, and they function exactly like overbearing helicopter parents. Elder brains exert an insane control over every Mind Flayer around it for five miles, to the point of actually overriding each Mind Flayer's consciousness and basically making them act as a hive mind. The Elder Brain dictates what the colony does, and each Mind Flayer is there to serve the goals of the Elder Brain. The Elder Brain is also like the most powerful version of those old school cable girls, as it allows each Mind Flayer to communicate with one another instantly through their psionic network. So if your party decides to infiltrate the colony and you get caught by one of these guys, now all of them know you're here. They are also the collective conscious of the entire colony, and they store all of the colony's knowledge and share it among all Mind Flayers after it, like a weird squishy little library. But a very interesting tidbit is that Mind Flayers are not a true hive mind, even if they have like a big mind, like a big brain mind that dictates what they do. You see, as I said before, the total control that the Elder Brain exerts over Mind Flayers has a range. 5 miles. Outside of that range, Mind Flayers are not under the constant eye of the Elder Brain, and when they're not under it, Mind Flayers are actually very much their own people. Individual Mind Flayers have thoughts, feelings, and opinions of their own. They have a very clear view of what the needs of the group are and how important those needs are, but they also have very different ideas as to how best pursue those goals, and they are very competitive about it. This becomes an issue when they leave on what they call inquisitions, little field trips that Mind Flayers take outside of the Elder Brain's control. Inquisitions are risky for the colony because the Mind Flayers that go on them gain back their individuality, which can lead to Renegade Mind Flayers. Oh, I see we went with the heavy metal edgy naming convention for that one. Renegade Mind Flayers is the name that Mind Flayers give to any Mind Flayer that somehow escapes the Elder Brain's control and decides to do something the Elder Brain doesn't want it to do. Many of them actually create their own colonies, although I'm not like crystal clear on how that works since you're supposed to be born an explicit, like different, better type of Mind Flayer that will one day grow up to be an Elder Brain, so... What happens with the ones that are renegades and create their own colonies if they're not, like, the, the ones that are born different are not renegades, they're just, they're born like that. Anyway, although others decide to learn arcane magic or settle down and start a nice bed and breakfast in Vermont, possibilities for them are endless, and I support them. Mind Flayers go on their little field trips in groups for strength and numbers, but also to keep each other in check, to ensure that none of them get any weird ideas about striking out on their own and stop being constantly controlled by their weird little mommy brain. They also bring thralls with them as muscle. And speaking of... Thralls. Thralls are this channel's favorite word, interns. When a Mind Flayer doesn't feel like eating a specific brain because diet culture got to them or whatever, they might decide to make a prisoner one of their thralls. Mind Flayer thralls basically lose all of their personality and individuality under the constant psionic pressure from the Mind Flayer and live to be their servants. When the writer is edgy and boring, Mind Flayers are just your basic boring D&D intern having people that mistreat them and are evil and yada yada yada. But a mind much cooler and more insidious interpretation is that Mind Flayers actually form connections with their thralls. They see them as inferior, but inferior like we see our pets, not inferior like we see, I don't know, roaches. They are sad when they die, miss them when they're not with them, and care for them. So if these guys' goal is not just be evil and they actually care for their thralls, what are they after? Let's take a look at the actual origin to find out. So honestly, there's a whole lot of lore and history to Elithids, and it's extremely convoluted and it spans like five editions and a half, but here goes the abridged version of it. We don't really know the origins of the Elithid. We know they are old, like extremely old. They appear in texts where races we know today didn't even exist yet. There are theories saying that they actually come from the future, but send themselves back in time, which would make sense since not even Ablet, we'll get to them, will remember everything, do not remember the origins of 
mind flayers, but we do not have a definitive answer. What we do know is that ages ago, they ruled the world. And like all the worlds, they were the rulers of everything, including the other planes. Yes, mind flayers are not only alien themed, they are actually aliens, and they travel through space using these cool ships that look like a Nautilus. They're called Nautiloids, they're so sick. Anyway, the mind flayer empire ruled over everything in the inner planes, but everything changed when the Gith attacked. The members of the race that they most commonly used as thralls developed a resistance against their psionic abilities and started training their own psionic powers. When they were ready, their leader, a guy called Gith, decided to strike against the Mind Flayers, and they succeeded. In a series of coordinated attacks, they brought countless Elder Brains down, and in less than a year, they had almost completely destroyed the Illithid Empire. These guys would go on to be called the Gith, and after they were done, they decided to hunt down the remaining Mind Flayers. Gith could get their own own videos someday, but real talk here, I am someone that cares a lot about aesthetics and visual presentation, and the GIF looks so ugly and unappealing to me that I just have not looked into them past the most basic stuff. So if that video is ever happening, it's far away in the future. But anyway, the Illithid Empire was destroyed, and its survivors are being hunted down by very mad former interns. Mind Flayers have now gone into hiding, hoping to rise again one day. But why? 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 Is it just your boring baseline, they want power sort of motivation? Actually, no. Mind Flayers do not see themselves as evil at all. Illithid culture sees their goal as noble. They believe that they were put on this plane to bring order and tame chaos. They believe that without them, other races live aimless lives of chaos and suffering, and it's their duty to bring them into the Illithid fold and give them purpose, saving them from themselves. They see themselves as the universe's caretakers, and their goal is basically to expand for the betterment of the cosmos, which they they believe can be achieved by everyone either being a thrall or a mind flayer. Now that's a cool villain motivation right there. But hold on, how are they going about that? Well, it's time to talk about the gross stuff, children. So, when a mind flayer and a hapless rando love each other very much, the mind flayer takes out a weird little gross worm that lives in the brain pool of evil and puts the worm inside the guy. And that's how babies are made. Good talk. Okay, let's actually get into it. Mind flayers do not reproduce sexually, much to some people's dismay, you weirdos. No, their way to make more mind flayers is significantly more sexy. Mind flayers lay eggs. Okay, hold on. Please imagine one of these skinny, beanpole looking ass squid weirdos doing that. Hold that thought for a second in your mind. Like, is he squatting while he does that? Wizards, release the art illustrating that fascinating process of laying eggs, I beg you. What actually comes out of those eggs are not little baby elephants, but tadpoles. These tadpoles are then dropped into the brine pool where the elder brain lives, and they are fed brains and each other for 10 years. 10 whole years of just swimming and eating each other. Neat. After 10 years, the buffest tadpoles are then taken out of the brine pool and the ceremony of ceramorphosis can begin. The way this works is extremely inspired by the reproduction of xenomorphs of Alien. The best horror movie of all time. Fight with the wall, fight with your mom, fight in the comments, I don't care, it is. An illithid tadpole is implanted into a host, a process that Baldur's Gate has helpfully illustrated for us in stunning 3D graphics. And Warning here, if you're not wild on I stuff happening with worms, maybe skip to here on the screen, but do not fret. I have made it much more tolerable to watch by putting it through a 2010 DIY YouTube filter. Hit it! After that lovely process, wait between 5 to 10 business days, or like an entire game depending on how the tadpole feels that day, and presto! New Mind Flayer. Mind Flayers are however extremely picky about who they put their little gross worms into. Apparently hide is a big thing, and they'll only choose hosts that are around the size of an adult human to create other Mind Flayers, as most of the time choosing anything other than this leads to the death of both the host and the tadpole. However, Mind Flayers can get creative, which usually means putting their tadpoles in hosts that they should absolutely not go into, and that's how we get the weird stuff. Creatures that underwent xeromorphosis but did not produce a normal mind flayer are called xeromorphs. 
Let's do a quick run through of some of them. Gnome Zero Morphs are what happens when a mind flayer with a weakness for short kings chooses a gnome as their host. These little guys retain the size of the host, so they look like cute little chibi mind flayers. Look at it. Emperor Zerg looking ass. Interestingly, they also retain much of their personality and even their alignment if you use it, which means that Gnome Zero Morphs can be of any alignment in canon, which is kinda neat. They are known for keeping their gnomish love of tinkering and being particularly peaceful. Trying to use normal Xeromorphosis on a gnome invariably fails, so in order to create gnome Xeromorphs, the process has to be changed. When this new updated process fails, the result is a gnome squidling. Yep, squidling. They have weak little bodies that basically can't move on their own, so they rely on levitating with their psionic powers while they steer by pushing their little tentacles. They are described as basically being as smart as a toddler or a house cat. They are powered by their hunger for tasty, tasty brains, but not by much else. And they're not evil or good, they're just like an animal. These could make for fun pets, or like a really dark and sad ending to a noble gnome wizard, forced to end up as this unthinking thing that is barely above the level of cognition of a baby. Mind witnesses are what happens when a beholder goes through seromorphosis. They kind of look like a beholder, big round orb with one eye and little tentacle eyes, but they also sprout four tentacles around their mouth. They are apparently used as radio towers, as they are able to communicate telepathically with many people at once, which makes them useful when out of range of the Elder Brain's control tower. Beholders, just like mind flayers, believe themselves to be the best life force in existence. Side note here, go watch my video on beholders or so help me god! So mind flayers made sure that when beholders go through the tadpole mumbo jumbo ritual, they become extremely subservient. As a result of this, if a mind witness is separated from their mind flayers, it would immediately seek out other creatures to serve. So all in all, pretty helpful little guy. Give it to your party or something. And now for the obligatory dragon one, we have Brain Stealer Dragons. Oh, I, I see we're back to the naming convention from before. This happens when mind flayers decide to fuck around with a dragon and then found out. They tend to be better at lying and scheming than your average dragon, but their biggest feature is their breath weapon being replaced by a huge psionic blast that confuses and stuns their enemies. They're also really bad at flying. Honestly, kind of underwhelming. They should revisit this concept. I feel like there's more to do here, but I don't care about dragons enough to do it. And finally, if the nanny is slacking and the colony lets a tadpole grow past its due date, a neotholid happens. Neotholids are usually found when a colony of mind flayers die. The tadpoles are left unsupervised, and eventually only the strongest tadpole remains. Remains. It keeps growing until it becomes one of these. Mind flayers actually despite Neotholids, because Neotholids are basically kryptonite to them, as well as a sort of representation of their biggest fears. They are less a living being with thoughts of its own, and more like a monstrous beast driven only by instinct, which means they have very low intelligence, which means they are completely invisible to elder brains and impossible to control through psionics. These things will hunt any creature with a brain indiscriminately, including mind flayers. So creating them is taboo, and they are seen as horrible abominations. And they are a bunch more. And not just seromorphs. These guys did fun experiments of all kinds. We have... Best Dog, Pinky and the Brain, It's My Turn on the Xbox, The Thing 1982, Anime Mistake, A Bug's Life, Stranger Things Demogorgon Remix, and many, many more. And that's pretty much it. Those are Mind Flayers. We've talked about their psionic abilities, their culture, their history, their origins, their weird tadpole based reproduction method, and that's nice and all, but what if we gave Mind Flayers a new twist? So you wanna fight a Mind Flayer? <laughs> Mind Flayers are 500 IQ Cthulhu inspired aliens that have a creative solution to reproduction. So let's take a quick look at Mind Flayers as they stand in the game today. Run the scans. Okay. Interesting. Hmm. Yes, our test determined that Mind Flayers are pretty good. Mind Flayers are some of the most iconic monsters of DD. I mean, they're on TV now. I don't see dragons hanging out in Stranger Things. 
to say it. Mind Flayers are a great way to bring some sci-fi horror into your high fantasy game, if that's what you're into. So how do we give a twist to that? Well, simple really. In the game, there are several processes that are not detailed. As in, we don't know exactly how someone becomes a lich, for example. We don't have rules as to what happens if a warlock disobeys their patron, or their patron disowns them. Now, controversial opinion here, but this is good. It's good for two reasons. The first is that having an official answer to these questions will deprive them of their mystique. If you gotta make this check to beat that DC to do X thing, it loses part of the magic. It's now a game mechanic that players know. It's not an unknowable, mysterious thing. But more importantly, the second reason why this is good is because it's now in the hands of the DM to decide what happens. And having no official ruling means that nobody can dispute their ruling. Maybe in your world a lich happens when you unlock your sixth mystical toe by understanding all episodes of Rick and Morty and insulting a McDonald's employee in your quest for discontinued sauce. Great! That is now canon in your world and is as good an answer as any. You get to decide the process. Seermorphosis, the act of turning into a mind flayer, is one of these left to DM's discretion things. The specifics of Seremorphosis are not outlined anywhere. Is it a save? How long exactly does it take for it to take hold? How gradual is the transformation? Can you stop it? Who knows? Or rather, you, the DM, know. You get to decide. But what if you would want that to happen in your game, but you would like some guidance? Well, last time I checked, I was not an official source for D&D, so whatever I write is not canon! So what if we made some rules as to what happens during the process of Seremorphosis? What if I took some time, and you, as a player, got some incredible psionic powers from it? But every time you used them, you were one step closer to losing your humanity. Or like, Elfanity. Or Kianity. Tiflianity. You get it. And yes, comment section, I know that it takes about a week to turn into a Mind Flayer. I've said so in this very video, but we have a very clear precedent in official sources of this process taking longer and people gaining access to psionic powers as it goes on. So I'm doing it. Imagine a system where you are implanted with a tadpole that for some reason, maybe it's a juvenile, maybe it's defective, maybe it's something else, does not transform you outright. You start developing small psionic abilities, and every time you use them, they become stronger. But but as your psionic abilities become stronger, so does the illithid tadpole inside of you. Every time you use one of your illithid abilities, there's more and more of a chance for you to finally turn into the monster that implanted you when it's young. But every time you use them, you also unlock new cool abilities that you didn't have before. If you're in a tight spot, it might feel very, very tempting to finally use that insane psionic ability you got. But if you do, there's an ever-growing chance of completing the transformation and becoming a mind flayer yourself. And hey, it doesn't even have to be a player. Imagine your players accompanying this young man with a talent for psionics. His power keeps growing, but you, the DM, know that it's because he was implanted with an illithic tadpole. Every time he uses his abilities, he is one step closer to turning into what he fears most. It's an octopus-shaped ticking time bomb. It's a gamble. It's drama. It's access to psionics at a steep cost. It's in the description below for free. That's right. Rules to run a tadpole infestation in your players' brains are written in the description below, and they sure are 100% free. You get not only rules on how to run it, but also the cool psionic abilities you get as your psionic power grows. Reminder here that Mind Flayers are copyrighted material, so if you're wondering why some words are not present on that doc, you know, think about it. You're smart, you'll get it. So go out there, bend the will of this fantasy game by turning into a sci-fi horror show and turn your friends into weird octopus aliens. And that's it, we did it, the video's done, woo! Honestly, when I first thought about doing Mind Flayers, I was convinced I would do a new Seramorph creature, but there were already so many that I just didn't know where to start. That's when the idea of doing something both for players and DMs crossed my mind. So if you're a player with some weird ideas as to where you would like your character to go, show this to your DM. If you're a DM that has some weird ideas of your own as to where the story might lead, I hope you find these useful. If you can tell, I love corruption mechanics, and I love that feeling of fear where you're pushed to use great abilities that put you in very real danger. And I hope you do too. All right, as always, thank you to every single one of you that subscribes to my little dog and pony show. And special thank you to those that like the videos and comment and double specially to those that share it around with your friends. The channel is very young. I know I say this every video, but it still is. <laughs> it's that we haven't grown old yet. We're still, I don't even think we're in our teens. We're in our five month baby teens. We are getting dangerously close to that 100k subscriber Feywild video that I talked about last time, so, you know, 
go slowly. I am not yet done with the video. Please don't get there too quickly. But but yes, end of the video. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Eat seafood. It's good for you. Great source of protein and all. Better for the environment than other animal protein sources most of the time. Argue in the comments about that. Okay, love you. Bye-bye now. Bye. Mwah.